What is going on, my fellow conspirators and conspirators? Welcome to the Underground Marketing Conspiracy. Woo. I'm very excited today. I met this gentleman about six months ago. I find that he has some very interesting beliefs and opinions about business. And it brings a different perspective to the show because I always have a lot of entrepreneurs on and he brings so many interesting ideas to the table. So my guest today is the founder and CEO of Human Fluent, which has been providing customized leadership and HR solutions since 2013. Along with his leadership team of highly accomplished executives, he brings cutting edge thinking, creative execution, and professional excellence to every project, all while investing his full attention to understanding all of his clients' needs. So without further ado, I would like to welcome to the show Mr. Telvin Jeffries. Telvin, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Awesome. Super excited about this. Thank you so much. All right. So first of all, why don't you describe the types of people you work with and really what sort of results you help them achieve? Yeah. So primarily I, I work with uh, executives and it's a broad range. I mean, I work with really small organizations who who I would call their startups. And then I work with uh, global brands. So, I mean, you know, I have companies in my store like Toyota uh, mm-hmm. and um, and then I have companies who are software tech companies here doing 20 million. And I generally work with the senior executives and most of our work is really around how do we move away the things that aren't important, things that are hindering the business from achieving results. And most of the time, it's really around um, three things. It's around people, process, and talent. Hmm. And talent's a big part of that because at the end of the day, uh, you know, the people, the people actually either create or drive, um, you know, drive the process. Um, and, um, and so one of the things that you know, we, we get our, our arms around is like, do you have the right people mm-hmm. and how do you motivate them and how do you, um, and do you have, do you have good ways to keep them engaged? Hmm. That's interesting. Awesome. Now I'm curious, like you've been doing this, it seems for a long time. Like tell me about your backstory, I guess. And just go back to the beginning as far back as you want, I guess. And what? Yeah, led I'm you like this kid this that grew up in Richmond, Virginia. I grew up in this <laughs> town that actually, you know, everybody says I grew in the in the in the one you know the one one light town. Um, you know, I actually grew up in that we didn't have any lights. Like it's like we had we had a hardware store, mm-hmm. a dry cleaners, and um, and uh, a, and a Seven Eleven, like a convenience store, and like that's where we went to get food, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, and um, but my parents like she worked in the big city, and so um, I I was the guy who always the wanted to. So I grew up in Richmond, Virginia. I was the guy who always wanted to get out. Hmm. Like okay. I knew, like a very, it's like I'm gotta leave this place, um, and I um. I always, as a kid, where other kids were, like, so I was a kid when everybody wanted to play, like, football or basketball. I was the guy who wanted to play like I was the general manager, like Mm -hmm. I owned the teams. Um, And I was, and I was the guy who was in the neighborhood orchestrating, like, the teams against the teams and, like, you know, so I've always been the business guy. And anyway, I went to, I, I started working for a retailer where I was in high school. I worked through them, for them in high school and college. Um, and I got my first chance to be a human resource manager right after college as a trainee. And Mm -hmm. I just loved it. I thought it was great because in HR, you get to kind of see everything. Mm -hmm. And I happened to work in an organization where it wasn't like, you know, a typical HR person where you're like, you know, you're just interviewing people, but I was involved in like the decisions and how we ran, you know, the business. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I grew my career there and I ended up going to be a chief human resource officer at like 34 years old in a 14 billion dollar company with like a hundred thousand employees so it's like crazy and 
I was the guy who also at the same time was like, no, I need more than just HR. Now I'm 34. Like I'm a little crazy, yeah. but I'm like, <laughs> all right, I need more than just this. I'm not, I need more than just, you know, running HR with a team of 300 people and four and a hundred thousand employees. Um, I need more. And so the company was good, gracious to me. They gave me other responsibilities outside of HR and that was really cool. And then I decided um, in my early 40s to actually go and try an opportunity where someone's going to allow me to run HR, but also run international operations for the company. And so that's what I did. I actually, I, um, I did a couple things. I ran all of the kiosks, mobile kiosks, so like mobile phones and all that stuff, and all the Target stores for a while. Mm. Um, we own that Radio Shack, the company I work for, own that business. Um, and then I ran international non u s uh, non u s stores I was the um the guy, the general manager president of Radio Shack Mexico. We had about three hundred stores. I spent a lot of time in Mexico traveling all over places that i've never uh never know, you know I think about Mexico back then. I thought about it as like you know going to the beach, but like there's you know there's a whole big world of like yeah. you know cities and towns and all this other stuff that's got nothing to do with tourism and so i did that and then five years ago i started this company because i um thought like let's take everything that i've been doing and i think this is interesting for entrepreneurs right is that at some point um you got to trust yourself because everybody else is trusting you like i had this thing where i spent 20 years working for other people and um and in fact, they had more faith in me than I had faith in me. Mm. And one day it just kind of, a friend of mine actually said to me, I'm in New York. I'm not, I'm in, I'm in Beverly Hills. And I'm at this place called a Soho house. Uh, it's like this private club. And I have a friend who's a, who's a, who's an author. He's a best selling author. And he said something to me. He was like, one day you're going to wake up and realize that, you have to finally start trusting you. Everybody else is putting their money behind you, but you won't. Mm -hmm. That was like a boom moment for me because I was like, at that moment, I was like, it's time to make a change. A year, a year later, I just, I left and started my own thing. Mm -hmm. It's funny. I, I can totally relate because I left my job last year in June and it had been, I had had that same kind of itch for a while where I'm like, man, and I had the same thing too. It's so funny because I had so many people being like, man, like you have all these skills, you need to go out, you can help a lot more people when you go out on your own. So right. what sort of advice would you have? Because there's a lot of people out there who they, they're working a full-time job and they don't necessarily want to become an entrepreneur per se yet, but they definitely want to advance in their career. Maybe they're conflicted in their concern. So what sort of advice would you give to someone who has a lot of ambition and they want to get to that next level in their career. Yeah, I think if you, for me, I think what I have noticed is probably three things that are consistent um, for myself. It was consistent for myself and what I see, the advice that I give to other people who want to actually have a meteoric success, meteoric success. I think number one is that people don't spend enough time understanding business, like build business acumen. Mm -hmm. understand how business works and understand in your company how business works and not the you know like i you know i have to say the the overly trite stuff like you know i understand like that my company sells you know paper and you know we and our paper is unique because it's got 15 percent of duda i mean who cares like do you really understand what EBITDA is like, do you know what earnings are before interest, depreciation and taxes, right? Like how does this thing really work and what are board members and investors really looking for? So if you understand business, you'll be able to bring more value and you won't come to people and say, hey, I think this is a great idea. Well, you know, ideas are whatever, right? It's actually, I have it's a great idea because I understand how we make money and how we can actually make more money and you're speaking intelligence. So I think business acumen is number one. The second one that I will say that I think people that we, that we kind of miss is that, you know, you got to make your boss look great. People are so focused on their getting credit 
So and true. Um, for themselves, and you know, this is the whole idea that I think I love about, um, I think entrepreneurs today is that entrepreneurs for the most part um, have realized that their, that their wealth is tied to the, to the number of people they can serve and how greatly they can serve. Well, when you're in a corporate role and you're trying to grow your career, I mean, the same thing. It's like, how, how can you serve better? And the way to serve better is actually know what they want, really. And number two, get really clear about what your boss needs to be successful and go all out and make them successful. And your thing will come. It just does. People, even if your boss is a jerk, right, and he just, or he or she just rides and takes all the, you know, takes all the credit, you know what? People still know. They know who's doing what, and that person ends up blowing up. So um, it, it, that's, that's number two. The third thing that I say that, and, and this is probably, um, I mean, it's equal. I don't think there's a one thing, but these are the three things that I've seen that really work really well. But the third one that I think is a kind of a powerhouse is um, you, you got to have a good balance between strong technical skills and, and good connections. Hmm. Like we undervalue, there, there's something called the double spike. There are people who are at one point in their career who they, you got you to spike both. Like you can have all the skill, but you don't know anybody. Like, you don't know nobody in your industry. Nobody in their industry knows you, right? You mm -hmm. have no good relationships outside of the five people you work with at your company. Well, that just doesn't make a lot of sense. Raise the level of connections that you have so that, one, when you need something, you know, how to, you know who to call, and it's not the first time you're calling them, mm -hmm. right? And if you can raise your technical skills and your professional and your um, and your professional relationships at the same level, you've double spiked. You're gonna last. The guy who actually has no, has a bunch of relationships, but they don't have the technical skills, they lose. Right? Mm -hmm. Something's gonna happen because you're gonna not be valuable anyway. Even the people who love you, they're not gonna be able to figure out where the heck to put you. Mm -hmm. But if you can get both of those running. Right. So build great relationships and get outside of your organization. My whole career, I've always said I can learn enough from the people. I don't need to go to lunch with people who work in my department every day. That's the goofiest thing I've ever heard of. Go to lunch with people in departments that you know nothing about what they do, like finance. Mm -hmm. Right. If you're in another part of the business, learn what the heck those people are talking about. Right, because then you're going to be smarter than everyone else because they're afraid to go have a conversation with the people in finance because they feel like they got to be able to give a bunch of great information. You don't need to do that. What you need to do is be, you need to have knowledge, but you have to not, and with, and you need great connections. You, you got those three things you're going to take, you can take this, you can take this because guess what? 99% of, of the world aren't, is not doing this. It's so it true. It ain't that hard. It's so true. I, I wow. <laughs> that was like one of the most valuable things <laughs> I've ever heard in my entire life. All three of those things. I'm honestly going to re-listen to that like, like 10 times just to really knock that home. All right. So one of the things I've noticed right now in society is that there's a lack of leadership, like not just necessarily in organizations, but whether it's in politics, just in society in general. So what would you say that the main traits are that you believe a great leader should possess? Not a good leader or an average leader, but a great leader. What sort of traits do you think they should possess? Well, so hope this is not, not a problem. I'm a guy who answers questions in threes. Awesome. Um, Go for it. All right, good. So I think first of all is um, a great leaders are very clear about the future they believe is important. Mm -hmm. And you know, you don't even have to be always right, but you got to be directionally right. And you got to be able to willing to get people to go along with you. And along the way of, of the mission, right, the smart guy, which leads to the second part, which is the guy who's open to listening to other people and vulnerable, he'll course correct, mm -hmm. or she'll course correct. But I got to first have a mission, I got to have something that's worth following. This is why when you look at politics, and um, you know, I, I use this example. So I'm going to say this, and I don't know if this is a bad thing in the show, but I'm going to say this. 
Go like in the United States, right? Everybody is sitting, you know, everybody was like, oh, I don't know about Trump. I don't know about Hillary Clinton. But at the end of the day, Donald Trump won for one reason. The dude had a mission. Yep. Okay. Her mission was don't, let's beat him. Yep. That's not a mission. That's why you lose. I mean, beating a person's not a mission. I can't, I can't, I can't embody that. Right. Yep. And so number one is like, you got to have a mission. And I think we're missing the idea that people need to feel something. They don't need to just know something. They need to feel something. Great leaders help you feel it mm-hmm. because it, it needs to, it needs to embody, it needs to embody your, it needs to embody your cells of your body. Like you just need to be like jumping up about it. Like I'm willing to, you know, I'm, yeah. I, I'm going to, why am I going to spend 10 hours, 12 hours a day with you on doing something like if I don't feel it. Right. Yeah. So number one, they're not, a, it's this whole idea about mission and I can connect you to it. Right. And I, and, and I know everybody talks about vision, but I'm like, okay, vision's good, but I need a mission. Like what the heck are we doing? Who are we change? What, what are we changing in the world? What are we making better? If we're making something better in our industry, I work with a company right now. Um, or I'm, I'm doing some coaching with someone at a company right now. And like, it's really simple when we say this, like their whole idea is they have decided to take the FICO, look at like the FICO score, but create the same thing around data security. Mm. So a company gets basically a, da- a data security score, right? That's game changing, right? If, so if you want, I mean, their mission is to make it safe to do commerce. Mm-hmm. But they built, they match it up something that's proven. Everybody likes a number. Everybody likes a report yeah. card. Right? I mean, that's a mission. And these people are so focused on doing this because they believe that they're doing something to make the world better and safer. And the employees and the team believe it. So, so that's number one, this whole idea of mission. Number two, so I got a mission I can get connect people to. And then number two, this whole idea that a leader has to be somebody who listens and is vulnerable. Like, just be real and honest with us, right? Let, like, you don't know everything. And tell us when you don't know. And when, we're, when you're wrong, come back and say you're wrong and say, guys, all right, we're course correcting. Hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. And the third thing I think is that you got to be able, you got to be someone who actually is an influencer. And what's an influencer? Influence is somebody who can help you th- help you or teach you how to think. Hmm. I can, I need to help you understand how to think, how to think about the world so that it raises your level of commitment and the level of effort that you put in it. So how do I want you to think? If I go back to that company I told you about with the school, with the data security yeah. company, what are they doing? They're teaching the world how to think about security data performance. Mm-hmm. I can teach you how to think. If you go back through history and you watch any leader, right, at the end, the, the, they, I, we can go back to people like Martin Luther King or Gandhi. Yeah. They were like, no, you're looking at this wrong. I'm going to teach you how to think. That's influence. And we can do that every day in our own lives, right, when we actually can, can, we can start to go, hey, I, I hear what you're saying, but have you ever thought about it this way? What if we did this? If we did this, what do you think? What do you think people will, how will people act differently? What will tomorrow be um, like? And that's, you can do that in your organization. You can do that with your, with your customers. But, but at the end of the day, influence is driven by getting people to think, think a different way. Wow, that is so true. That's so true. I think that comes back to what you were talking about before in the previous question with business acumen, because you can take that and essentially influence people with all that stuff when you understand their perspective as well. Yes. Excellent. All right. So, all right. Last decade, 
there was this term that came up. I'd never really heard about it before, but I know you work in, obviously you have a huge history in human resources. So there was this buzzword, it was huge last decade. It was like company culture or organizational culture. All right. It was one of the biggest buzzwords of the last decade. Everyone was talking about it, but I still see so many businesses out there ignoring the importance of culture, like regardless of their size, whether it's a small business, a medium business, a huge enterprise, they just ignore this. So why do you think so many companies struggle with building a culture? Um, because it takes a lot. It, well, first of all, I think every, um, every company has a culture. Hmm. They might not have one that you like. You created one and you've created one um, by action or inaction on purpose or or by mistake you you have a culture people either people either um treat either, treat people well they think about the customer they are results oriented or not and um i think the reason that uh, companies aren't able to create a, a high performance culture is because they're often they're dishonest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, they say they want a cult, they want a high performance culture, but the behaviors of the leadership are inconsistent with the values that they say they want. And so they tell the organization, uh, they tell people, we want you to be this. We, we, we represent these values, but they don't represent them themselves. Mm -hmm. They will do, they'll make short-term decisions mm -hmm. on long-term issues. Mm -hmm. And when you make short-term decisions on long-term issues, you tell the organization that your value or your culture conversation is bullshit. So... <laughs> right and so eventually and people will do in alignment what allows them to be successful based off of how what you, what you deem deem as right by your actions mm -hmm. and when you do all of that it all compiles to create a culture because culture is like this 800 pound gorilla yep. right that um, you're feeding every day with what I call integrity, right? It is your focus and your business, who you say is really important, what you say is really important, right? If you tell people, we got to treat everybody, we're going to do the right thing and we're going to treat people right and we're going to focus on the customer but then you guys get in trouble one month and you need more sales and you do crazy things to get the number and you, and you beat people up and you're like, you know, you, I don't care. You know, you need to work, you need to work 20 hours yeah. a day. Right. And then you, and then, right. Well, it's all inconsistent. That's why I say it's, it's a lot of times it's because people are honest. Mm -hmm. It's not really what you really, that's not the culture you want. It's the culture you'd like to say you have. Hmm. And to do that culture, I work with I I um I work with some companies who do culture really really well, um and I'm lucky. But I also get to see companies who espouse values. Like one of the things here right now is this the their their companies who have what we call conscious capitalism. I don't know if you've heard of it. I'm not. But it's where why don't, you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, before. conscious capitalism is basically the concept of. You know, our business model is that we're going to we're going to do things that are always in the best interest um, of our employees, of our customers, and of our community. And it's all about investing also mm -hmm. in those in those in those three areas. And that means that our decisions may not necessarily be the ones that might be uh, normal. Um, you know, what I would say, uh, economically driven. Mm -hmm. because we're 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 we we may it may be we may have to invest short term and take some and take some hits so that the long term we're doing the right thing for for the people in our business for our customers and for our communities mm -hmm. you know sometimes that's really that's a good idea i mean it's great but that's really hard to execute mm 
Definitely. Because sometimes there's just stuff you got to do in your business to survive or to make sure you hit the bottom line, to make sure you get money back to your investors and your shareholders mm -hmm. that are not necessarily incongruent with de delivering that. And if everyone's not bought on in, in that, then, then that, that's, that, that doesn't make sense. And those are kinds of cultures where I love what they're trying to do, but I feel like I also see um, like just being practically in day to day things that are actually that business just sometimes requires you to be inconsistent with that. Mm. I know. I mean, listen, yeah, we all want to take care of customers. We all want to make sure we take care of our employees, but there's also, there's a, there's a, there's a, um, what do you call it? I mean, there's, there's a, there's a limit, right? Because it's the, it's the person who doesn't come to work because they got like a lot of crisis at home and, and a conscious capitalism environment you can actually you can make that an overused um kind of attribute of your company because taking care of that person uh at, at some point gets to be it compromises your customer it compromises yep. other employees that's what i'm saying so when you think about culture you do end up making you have to make really tough decisions you know i'll use another example and you think about HR, you know, I've been in, I've been in, in environments where there are people who are the best performers. I mean, they get the results consistently day in and day out, but they're jerks. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. And um, so what do you do? That's an opportunity to actually influence your culture when you say, you, it's not how it's not that you just get the results it's how you get them because mm. if you don't get them in a way that's consistent with the way we want to do business and facilitate what we want to create here guess what you're jacking up our business dude ma'am you gotta go yeah Man, that is that is powerful. Oh man, <laughs> that is good stuff right there. All right, so, man, all right. So, how did you find out about all this stuff? Like, what I, I think we've talked before, and I know you're a voracious reader and you're a lifelong learner. So, I'm a big reader myself. Like, I I'm obsessed with it. Business books, any kind of nonfiction books. So, are there any books specifically throughout your life, or maybe even some ones you've read recently that have really helped you on your jersey on your journey and that you could recommend to my listeners? Yeah. Um, I, I would say I'm a, I'm a, I'm a guy. I, I like classics, right? I mean, yeah. and I like going back to the same book over and over again um, because I think they are, um, they're extremely, they, they, they're uh, there's a lot of times today. I feel like, you know, there's a, you know, you see the book, like don't give an F right Subtle Have art of people, not giving it like, up. Yeah. Stuff, I mean, it's <laughs> like, stop. Like, okay, there's like interesting. Like, I maybe there's two or three tidbits. I'm not knocking anybody's book, okay? Yeah. Um, but I would go, some of that's like a little crazy. I like the classes because there's depth. So, I mean, the thing, their books, like, I will tell you, like, The Seven Habits of a Highly Effective People. Like, yeah. I go, like, read that book once a year. Yeah. Because I guarantee you, you ain't doing it. Yeah. Okay. The book that's over and over is a win is um i know this is trite but look it's like um it's it's how to win friends and influence people like read that book over and over right another book i love is um i love the tipping point by malcolm mm -hmm. gladwell it is good i've read all of his stuff he's a great, it's really good great author. um think and grow rich by napoleon hill i go i don't understand why people aren't reading that all the time here's mm -hmm. another book that i tell people to read all the time and i don't care what your beliefs are there's some good stuff in there. It's the Bible. Mm, I'm telling true. you, for me, I've learned so I've learned a lot of things in there. I'll give one, I'll give you one right now. People go and I go, if you understood this, it changed your life. There's it's Ecclesiastes 9 and 11. I'm work I'm sharing this with a client the other day. <clears throat> and and I'm going to not one of the things it says, it says the race does not, that he says, I have learned that the race does not actually go to the person who's the swift. It doesn't actually, wealth doesn't even come to the smartest person or the person who works the hardest. But time 
and chance happen to all. Mm. Everyone gets their time and chance in life, but you better be paying attention. Because if you don't seize the opportunities and fear, because you don't, you're not smart, you're not the strongest, and you don't have the, and you don't have the right opportunities, and you take the, you take the idea of that I'm not enough, and you don't take your opportunity, somebody else will. That changed my life. You talk about that opportunity that I told you about. When I left Richmond, I got a chance to move from Richmond to Washington, D.C. And then, and then a year later to Wisconsin. And if anybody knows about this, going from like the south all the way to north, to, to the north, there are no black people in my mind in Wisconsin. Black people don't move there. Black people stay in the South or we're in the East Coast. And I decided that if I wanted to be, if I want to be successful, I needed to go to a place where I was a novelty and I wasn't like everybody else. Mm -hmm. Okay. That turned out all these opportunities I had became for that because I did not use fear what could be, what couldn't happen, what might happen. And I, it's because I really have always believed that time and chance happen to everyone. I got to take, look, doors open, man. I got to, I got to take my shot. I got to shoot my shot. If I'm wrong, I can always go back. You can always retreat, but you can't always go get the opportunity. And if you buy into the idea that you're not smart as the other person, I'm not as smart as these people. I don't know what they know. I don't have the money they have. I don't have the connections they have. All of that's bull crap. It does, that's not how it works. The guy who tells you that it's because I got a great education and I went to this college and I know these, I mean, and I, and I was really smart and I worked hard. That's rare. You know, like that's, that's rare. Most of us actually just took our shot at the time when it was right. And, and here's the last part I'm going to make, providence, whether you say it's God or whatever, providence, the universe, it creates opportunity for every person, but not every person sees it. Wow. And when we don't see it, it's because we're operating in fear. Hmm. Yeah, that is... <laughs> That is deep stuff. All right. <laughs> yeah, I, I really agree with you, though. The classics are good. I mean, the Bible, there's one person I follow, this gentleman, Myron Golden, and he teaches business through the Bible solely. And there's so many lessons you can learn from there, not just about business, but in life and just everything that you mentioned as well. Um, so I ask this on every single episode to all my guests, especially since it's a new year. So new decade, 2020. All right. New year. What sort of trends do you really foresee happening in business over the next year and really just in the next 10 years in general? Well, we know that artificial intelligence is going to dictate a lot. And I don't mm -hmm. know that we all understand what that really means, but I think it, it definitely means um, that you have another entity competing with you. <laughs> right yep. you know like we're, we're always talking about like okay i gotta compete with this other person i gotta be smarter than this person i gotta figure this out but at the end of the day i think you're competing with another entity that we don't understand mm -hmm. so i think you gotta ask yourself what the heck does that mean yeah okay um number two i think um we are underestimating um for me i think you're going to see i think because we're underestimating the impact of social media Everything is contestable because of social media. So people are going to be really looking for truth and, um, and authenticity. More often, more now than ever, because think about it, all, every, everything that you almost know and were told was true, some guy, like me and you, who are working from home 
Now, I'm going to even say it's a little bit worse about guys like us. But look, there's some guy sitting in his basement with it in his underwear who's contesting long thought out ideas and theories and concepts that scientists and PhDs have put out there. Mm -hmm. And actually, it looks like they're right. What does that mean for guys out here, for us marketing, trying to sell things? It is going to require us to do a little bit more work than hype and buzzwords. Like, we got to bring it. Like, we got to be able to really connect with people in a way that's true and honest. And so I think it's going to, I think the trend, when I say trend, when you ask the subject trend, is I think the trend is that it's going to be a more demand and authenticity from us. And that means you can't be, again, you can't run in fear. You can't be afraid. You can't be afraid to show who you are, what you're really like, and where, where you used to could say stuff and hide behind. Uh, you could be safe or you could hide behind, you know, these different personas, but people are going to redo that now. So you, you're going to have to bring the real you and, and own that thing. Right. Definitely. I totally agree. Um, and then here's the last one that I think I see that I see out there. You know, I do a lot of coaching. And um, I do a lot of executive coaching with people. And I think there are a lot of guys out there doing life coaching and they're, you know, marketing coaches and and that kind of thing. Um, I think what I what I what I see um, is. um there's this trend behind mindset and mindfulness that I think is extremely important because I think we got to, we, we're, we're going to all be more effective when one, we actually change our mindset because mindset's what's killing our business. It's why we aren't hitting the numbers we need to hit. Why you're not making that one more phone call. Why you're not trying, why you're not closing one more deal it's not all this other stuff. I don't have the technology out of the time. I don't have enough money to market all that. That's all nonsense. At the end of the day, you, you don't right now, your mind ain't there. You, you're, you, the, the stories you're telling, the stories we're telling ourselves. Right. So what I see is this trend around mindset. You can see what's actually happening at big companies like Google and Microsoft. They're all getting, they're all focused on mindset. Like, how are you thinking? Are you mindful? Right? And I think um, understanding how your mind works probably is the next great thing that actually is going to make the difference between those who succeed and don't. So mm -hmm. can you figure out how you're thinking and how it's influencing you. And number two, can you get and can you figure out the mind of the people who you're trying to influence and sell to? Hmm. Wow. I understand their world and their world is not the nonsense that people are telling you uh, day in and day out about nonsense. You ask people about their business, they're most of the, they don't know what they're talking about or they're lying to you. <laughs> I'm being honest, right? <laughs> what I really need to know, like what's, I mean, heck, what's really going on? like in your business? What are you really worried about? What's really going on? What are you really thinking? What are you really afraid of? Yeah. You see, when we can get around that and see what's producing the thoughts, which is driving your actions, then I can, we can all, we can do some stuff. Mm -hmm. It's true. There's one question I always ask people too. It's like, you know, you ask them like, why are you doing this? And then they tell you and you're like, yeah, but why? And you just keep asking them why. And then after seven or eight rounds of it, that you finally get to that why and you yeah. understand them and then they have that breakthrough. That's like such a powerful thing. I think I've learned that from uh, Dean Graziosi about a year ago. All right. So I'm curious, like what sort of things are you working on right now in your business and just in general? Yeah. Um, well, I, I have, I, I keep like, I'm a, I'm a, um, I'm a, I'm a, uh, I'm an adapter. And so <laughs> I'm constantly saying, how are people buying? What are they? What are they buying? And why are they buying it? And and so you know, I have spent a lot of my time trying to, in my business, figure out 
what the customer wants and how I can actually, let, let me just, how I can make the most money and the shortest amount of time. You can tell I'm direct, right? I don't yep. cut the crap. I'm trying to figure out how to make the most amount of money and the shortest amount of time with the least effort. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> and that means without compromising service and expectation, right? And so I have tried, in my, you know, in my business, I have really tried to be full service with a few people. And I'm starting to get myself to the place where I am doing, where I'm really narrowing the services that I provide and how do I create um, more automated or something that's more that that is more um, on automation, mm -hmm. and where I have to spend less time with the individual clients, and um, and so I'm working. You know, I I know there's a model out there on the coaching world where people are deal they're building these programs, and they're you know they're putting they're doing online courses and all that other kind of stuff, um, and. And so I've, I've actually thought a lot about that, but I think that's a, I think that's probably problematic mm -hmm. long-term. I know there's a lot of people selling. Do you, have you noticed, I, I'm going to say something that's kind of crazy. The, a lot of the people who are actually selling services to coaches, coaches aren't selling coaches stuff to actually businesses. They're yep. selling stuff to coaches. Yep. And I go, okay, does that tell you something like, hello? Um, so where I'm, where I'm at is I'm, I'm trying to perfect, a long story short, I'm trying to perfect the model that allows you to really give customers great value, um, but deliver it in a way that they want it, mm -hmm. but also allows you to still have a life in sanity and not over invest. Um, and, and so I've been playing around with a number of different models because to answer your question and what I'm seeing right now is that, um, you can build a business and coaching talking to thousands maybe, or you can build a business where you go, I got 10 really good clients who actually rely on me and I, and I totally, and I'm totally invested in them and I'm customizing things for them all the time and I really understand their business. Mm -hmm. And I have 10 great clients, right, that pay me $30,000 a year or I can get, I don't know, 500 people who pay me $49. I mean, the truth is, what's more meaningful to you? Yep. It's so true. I think 10 great customers who pay me $30,000 a year. It's true. It's that uh the old adage, right? Quality over quantity. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. That's so good. All right. So now's your chance to really promote yourself. <laughs> so if people want to find out more about you or they want to work with you, where do you want them to go to find out more about you? Well, um, so my website is www.humanfluent. That's the word human and then fluent dot com i pride myself on being human fluent like trying to really figure out people so humanfluent.com um i'm also um you can also find me on um instagram i'm um, i'm just i am just telvin jeffries on instagram um but those are two ways to best reach me Perfect. All right. Awesome. Well, Telvin. I'm on all the other platforms, but they're harder to figure out. Okay. All right. <laughs> That's fine. I know you're a super busy guy. So, you know, enough said guys. Uh, Telvin, I want to thank you so much. I mean, I've had a lot of guests on here, um, but I just find you like so interesting. And I find everything that you have to say, like I, I could listen to you talk all day. Um, but I guess we'll end this right now, but I just want to sincerely thank you. And I really appreciate you for coming on the show and, bringing so much value to my listeners. So thank you so much. You're, you're welcome. It was a pleasure. I enjoyed it. And uh, 
Thank have a have a great day. Thank you for this. All right, awesome. Thanks a lot, guys. Go and check out Telvin. Go to humanfluent.com. Check out his Instagram as well. And guys, I'm gonna see you guys next time on another episode of the Underground Marketing Conspiracy. Woo.